wide awake and ready to go? Yeah. It's always a bit of a challenge to lead off the morning. I, I want to start by asking anyone who was not introduced earlier to please stand up. <laughs> I'm sure it's pretty stand up. And I noticed that my dear friend Dana Lamond did not stand up. Dana, glad you're here with us. I see a healthy blend of members and leaders I've known for 20 odd years. And those who I've met this morning or haven't yet had a chance to meet. And I think that's a critical part of leadership in Toastmasters is the constant evolution of who we are and who we need to become. As an organization, we are ever-changing. And as an organization, we love inertia and we love to fight change. <laughs> but the world's changing a lot faster than we are. And we struggle sometimes to keep up. And I appreciate each of you in that struggle to keep up. A couple of you this morning have said to me, you know, we're working really hard to get that club caught up to where it needs to be and presenting the program in the way it needs to present it. So the prospective members of today and tomorrow, when they attend that meeting, have the opportunity to experience a quality club. And organizationally, that's what we're all about, is having fantastic club meetings that lead to individual member achievement. I want to talk this morning for just a minute about this lock. When I was 13 years old, I worked a long summer with my grandfather. And he had just retired after 30 years in service for the United States government. And he traveled the world as part of the State Department. And he retired to a little town just up the road from here in southern Utah. And he said, I want you to come and work for me this summer. I had no idea what I was getting into. I thought it was going to be a party with my grandma, and that was not what happened. We built fences, we rototilled a garden, I had to run the horses, I did all kinds of crazy things. And I remember one day we were walking away from a shed, and this isn't it, this is a, an image we found. And my grandfather turned to me and said, make sure you put the lock on that shed. And I went back and I put a lock on it, it was a little lock like this with kind of a cheap chain and wasn't all connected very well. And, and I remember turning to my grandfather with my 13-year-old confidence and saying, Grandpa, I could tear that lock off and get into that shed. I don't understand why we even lock it. What's the point? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, small locks keep honest people honest. They're a reminder of what's right. And I view the rules that we have in Toastmasters as those reminders. They help us remember to do the things that are right. They help us remember to maintain the strength and the honesty and the integrity of the entire organization. I spent a lot of my life playing basketball, sport that I love. Now I love to watch it more than I love to play it. My, my knees aren't quite what they used to be. But I still play in a single league every year with a bunch of guys, and we're all getting kind of a little old and creaky. But we're playing against other old and creaky guys, so it's okay. <laughs> and year before last, we were in the championship game. And, and I'll say, with all due humility, we almost always make it to the championship game. And I have a good friend, and we were, some, the other team shot the ball, we're all fighting for the rebound, and, my friend grabs the rebound and he dribbles the ball and the whistle blows. And the referee calls the ball out of bounds. No, the referee, sorry, dang it, I ruined my punchline. The referee calls the ball, the referee calls the ball in bounds. And my friend turns around and starts to walk the other way. And the ref says, no, it's in bounds. The other ref comes over, they start arguing about it for a minute. And the four of us, not my great friend, look to him and he's walking down to the other end of the court. And he turns around and says, it was out of bounds. And it didn't matter what the ref said. He knew that it was out and that it wasn't our ball. And 
he stood up for that. And the refs eventually decided that they wanted to give us the ball. And then we had an argument because we weren't going to take it when we didn't believe that it was ours. And that's kind of old man basketball. <laughs> but I want you to think about that in terms of how Toastmasters works. When we talk about what happens in our organization, almost everything that happens is recorded or vouchsafed or talked about because of integrity. You know, we receive at World Headquarters thousands and thousands of CC applications every year, 25, 30,000 of them. Now, we don't know that any speeches are actually ever given at a club meeting. So think about the application. There is the date and the name of the speech, and off to the right, there's a little box. And what goes in that little box? The initials, right? The initials of the VPE, or whichever club officer happens to be around, and they fill that out and say, yeah, this person actually gave that speech. Integrity is the very foundation of who we are as an organization. Last year, we introduced something we call the core values coin. And there's one on each of your seats. On one side is the globe, our logo. And this represents Toastmasters International. And let's not confuse Toastmasters International with where I work. Toastmasters International is the worldwide network of clubs. It's the entire organization. It's who we are. It's those 330,000 plus members and 15,000 plus clubs in 137 or 40 countries. It changes almost every day. On the back of the coin, you'll see our core values. Integrity, respect, service, and excellence. And these core values are the foundation of our entire organization. All of our programs, all of our rules, everything we do is centered on these. These are the fountain from which all of that comes and the reason all of it works. There are some people who look at this and immediately flip the first two because they want to make an acronym that they can remember. But the board, working on your behalf, deliberately put integrity first, because they believe that integrity is the foundation and all else follows after that. So I, I would encourage you to keep this coin as a talisman of our organization's core values and who we are. Use it, if you need to, to remind others of who we are. So when you go to a Toastmasters meeting, keep it in your pocket or in your purse. And if something is not quite right, please take the coin out and toss it onto the table. And use it to remind all of us about who we are and what we stand for. Will you do that? Yeah. All right. I want to talk briefly about an experience I had probably about when I met Pam and Phil Ranieri when I had a lot of hair. <laughs> I, was, I was invited to a district meeting like this one, but it, it wasn't at a conference. It was a district executive committee meeting. And, and I attended this meeting. They asked me to speak. I wasn't quite sure what I was getting myself into. It was in the early years when I was beginning to understand what Toastmasters at the district level is and how it works. So there are three parts of this meeting. The first was food. <laughs> and it was on a Thursday night at 6.30, and I remember that there was food. And I don't remember what it was, but I remember that I was hungry, and everybody else was hungry, and we ate a lot of food. The second part of the meeting were the reports. Now, I think given the number of you who stood up this morning, everybody knows what a DEC meeting is. But I'll just remind us who's there. So back in those days, it was the district governor, the LGT, the LGM, the secretary of the treasurer, all the division governors, and all the area governors. And the biggest part of the meeting was the reports. So they got up and said things like, well, area XYZ is doing fine. And then we moved to the next report. And it was, we're, we've built X number of new clubs so far this year, and I think we're going to build this many more. All right. We went to the next report. 
Our conference registration looks good, it's up, it's growing, and we're going to have a good conference. Okay, you've been there, right? You, you've heard those, you've seen those. It goes on and on and on and on. <laughs> Seemingly never ending. And, and at the time, I remember thinking, I don't understand any of this. And, and then was my presentation. And I got up and I talked about some new product that we were releasing that was going to help clubs. And, and I thought I did a fabulous job. That was a joke. <laughs> but at the end of the meeting, I reflected upon it. Well, good morning. And I understood that my speech was not the best part of the meeting. Well, the best part of the meeting was the responses to the reports. Because the reports themselves, we could have read. We didn't need to be there for the reports. But there were in-depth, caring, helpful responses. So area governor, I see that you visited Club X. They don't have any new members this year. Tell us what's going on with that club. Help us understand. We don't seem to have any new clubs in Division Q. What's going on in Division Q? How can we help? We have experienced people here. Can we send them over to help you get things off the ground? Area governor, you haven't made any of your club visits so far. What can we do to help you out with those? Division governor, only half of your area governors are here, and none of them made any of their visits yet. What can we do to help you? And the meeting went on and on and on and on in a hugely productive, positive, helpful way. And I learned a vast amount at that meeting, not only from the content of that discussion and those responses and that help, but from the way in which that meeting was conducted. And for those of you who conduct these types of meetings at the district level, the division level, or even your area council meetings, I encourage you to have a real discussion and not simply to re recite reports that you could have emailed in the first place and saved everybody the drive and saved everybody the hour. Because the meeting is not about the meeting. The meeting is about the good that comes from attending the meeting. And if we're not getting good from our meetings, if we're not learning and growing, if we're not teaching, we shouldn't have the meeting. Let's respect people's time by giving them helpful meetings and even canceling a meeting if it's not going to be helpful. Can we do that? So I have a question for you. What is a district? Anyone? You're all, you're all willing to speak up. Members. Members. OK. Anyone else? Division. Divisions. Divisions. Support system for the clubs. Anyone else? Organizational charter. Leadership. An opportunity for the community to have self-development. Competitions. We'll have a few of those this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. It's a connection between the members that are national and the individual members of the club okay. that help organize them. A connector that helps organize everything. I think all of those are legitimate responses and mostly accurate. I view it this way. A district is a collection of clubs that is formed into areas and divisions. Those areas and divisions are temporary. Did you have a healthy argument in your DEC meeting this morning about realignment? <laughs> I, no, good, that's good. I generally avoid spring conference DEC meetings for that very reason. <laughs> so it's a collection of clubs that is formed into areas and divisions. And they're all temporary. Districts, in fact, are temporary. They're more long-lived than areas and divisions, but they're temporary. Occasionally, we get so wrapped around our area, as it's composed today, or our division, 
as it's composed today, or our district even, as it's composed today, that we struggle. And, and we, we believe more in the structure than perhaps we do in the mission of those entities. So uh, I, I began to do some research about this topic, wondering if it's always been this way. And I started with Dr. Smedley's writings. And if you've never read his early writings, I strongly suggest that you find them. The story of Toastmasters is one of them. Uh, if you look on the Toastmasters website, you can, can find these, and they're relatively well pressed. So in 1934, Smedley starts talking about districts. And the section of the book where districts are first mentioned is titled District Problems. <laughs> And I will say, 80 years later, there are a lot of district problems. <laughs> and part of that is that sometimes we don't understand what a district is or why a district is. But before there were districts, there were a lot of clubs. And we were starting organizationally to grow. And the primary problem that existed in those clubs in those days is the primary problem that exists in clubs today. The delivery of the Toastmasters program was inconsistent. The delivery of the Toastmasters program was high quality here and not so high quality there. People tended to make things up. They tended to be really hard or really soft. We've all seen those evaluations. They had personalities that wanted to control the, that club. We've all been in those clubs or seen those clubs. And so something had to be done to ensure consistency and quality amongst the clubs. So the founders of the organization did not say, hey, we need districts to do this. They said, we need area governors. And the area governor was established long before districts. Clubs were grouped into areas, and area governors were responsible for ensuring and supporting the quality of all Toastmasters clubs. And they traveled and did this. And if you ever get a chance to see ancient Toastmasters documents, it's fascinating to see the way this is written about and how it's depicted graphically. It's a whole lot of men in fedoras and briefcases running. <laughs> Smedley, in fact, in the 60s, so a lot of years later, said that the most important person in the organization was the area governor. And I believe that is the truth today. The area director is the most important person. Smedley's one caveat that he said was, maybe the international president, Michael Notaro, <laughs> is potentially more important than the area governor. I've known a lot of the international presidents. I've known a lot of area governors. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I love the international presidents. So the area governor, what, what do you actually do? No, no. What did they tell you you were going to do <laughs> when they talked you into doing the job? They said, maybe a visit or two to each club every year and put on a couple of contests. Is that fairly accurate? Yeah. 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 So you were hoodwinked. Because what they didn't say was, you're primarily responsible for ensuring that the clubs in that area are delivering a high quality pro project program so that the members experience a high level of member achievement. I'm not sure that you can do that with two quick visits that are 45 minutes long each and, and a two minute commentary at the end of the meeting. You gotta get to know them. And then they said, then you have to have some speech contests and a couple other things. Area directors delegate all the speech contest stuff away. Find somebody who loves to do that kind of thing and have them do it for you. Don't spend your time doing that. Spend your time getting to know those clubs, finding their strengths and weaknesses, and helping them help themselves. Don't do it yourself. Don't be the solution expand them and help them be their own solution. Each Toastmasters club is responsible for itself. Each member, and we all remember this when we signed 
the document, the membership application. How many of you read the Toastmasters promise on the back? Uh-huh, about 20% of people. But in there, it says, you're gonna follow all the rules, you're gonna help as needed, and you're more than willing to serve as a club officer. Usually they stop reading before they get to that part. <laughs> but that's what it says. So every member is ultimately responsible for doing that. So you'll have a club that says, district leaders, area director, we need help desperately. Come fix our club. We are very happy to come and spend time with you and teach you how to fix yourself and to work with you in understanding what the components are of a Toastmasters meeting that will help you get there, that will help you ensure quality programming and excellent member achievement. Let's talk about why a district is. Now, when my team sent over the title of this presentation, we immediately got an email back. And the email said, are you sure that why is a district is the title? Because it sounds kind of funny. It's a little non-grammatical. And uh, we're not quite sure that's it. And my response to that was, mission accomplished. That is exactly what I was shooting for. Because why districts exist is much more important than what districts are. And we're all here to do this. We're here to build new clubs and support all clubs in achieving excellence. When we do things other than this, we're not following the mission, and we're getting distracted from the reasons districts were even formed. So it was area governors first in a few areas, and then districts on top of that, 1934 the first districts. There was District 1 in California and Oregon and Washington. And no, District 2 was in Oregon and Washington, 1 in California, and it included Arizona at the time. District 3 in Arizona came later. Then there was a huge argument because District 1 needed to divide. It was just too big in Southern California. And, and the argument was over who gets to keep number 1 <laughs> and who ends up with some other number. So a brilliant politician came up with Founders District. So don't, let's not use a number, let's use a letter, which in 1944 was when this was, sounded great because it was before computer sortation. And nobody cared about mixing numbers and letters at the time. Now we have one weird letter district and the rest are numbers. So, so how much of our time do we actually spend doing this? I want you to think about that for the next few minutes. And, and area directors especially will circle back and will ask you that question. How much of your time do you spend doing this? And how much of your time do you spend doing other things? Let's touch on the moments of truth. How many of you knew what I said immediately and understood what the moments of truth are? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Most of you ha have that experience and understanding. So the moments of truth. First impressions, member orientation, fellowship and variety, communication, program planning and meeting organization, and membership strength. So, and achievement recognition. So let's look at them in, individually. First impressions, guest positive experiences and observations determine whether they will return and become members. Research tells us this, this is law, this is the truth. How many of you believe that you're in the top 10% of clubs in the world in the way that you create first impressions for guests, raise your hand. All right. Some of you didn't raise your hand. This is something then that you need to work on. Member orientation. This is all about teaching members about how Toastmasters works. What the CC manual is, what the CL manual is, what's this thing called table topics? Why do we have a joke master? What's that all about? if you happen to have those kinds of things. Uh, what's the awe counter? Why do we time things? All of those pieces that to us by now in our journey are second nature and are alien to new members. What is the most alien thing that new members and guests experience at their first meeting? Nope. Applause. Senseless, ceaseless, nonstop <laughs> applause. And I'm not saying don't do it, but, but it kind of freaks people out. 
And that's, and that, when we do market research to these people, they, that's the thing that comes up at the top of the list all the time. Boy, somebody can't sneeze without applause. <laughs> we, don't, we don't quite get that. So include that when you're talking to people. We fill, we appreciate certainly with applause, and we fill empty space with applause. We provide comfort with applause. Fellowship variety and communication. How about this one? Clubs provide a fun, friendly, and supportive environment that encourages enjoyable learning. I've been the president four out of the last five years, even though it's against the rules. It's the same six people. A few other people flit in and out. We spend most of the meeting telling inside jokes from the lectern that the guests and the new members don't understand. It's kind of boring. Anybody ever been to one of those? Yeah. Anybody ever tried to save one of those? Yeah. Those are tough. Our, our meetings have to have variety. They have to be a good time. I was at a meeting in Malaysia once, and there was a guy that came out, and they had something like a physical joke master. And he came out in a sarong, and only a sarong. <laughs> and he told the joke, and he did a dance, and he bounced all around. And then he changed clothes in front of us, hiding inside the sarong. There was no inappropriate exposure. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> I was also very concerned during the process that it, <laughs> it wasn't going to end up being funny. Do something different in your meetings. Don't get tired. Program planning and meeting organization. How many of you rope somebody into being the VPE who doesn't know yet how big that job is because of their innocence, right? We've all been there. Let's just help them do the job and help them do it well. Clubs create their own systems of how long are we going to schedule in advance, how are we going to handle gaps at the end, and that's really up to clubs to figure that out. But we've got to do it. We've got to make the programming work right. Membership strength. Membership strength. We could talk about this one for hours. Organizationally, our standard is 20 members. That number came long before any of us were born. We do see that clubs that have around 20 members, and it might be 18, it might be 22, it's probably not eight, and it's probably not 85, but clubs in the sweet spot provide the right amount of member engagement to allow for member achievement. If you're too big, you only speak once a year, you're never gonna get a CC. If you're too small, people, people get overloaded. How many of you have been the club president, the Toastmaster of the day, a speaker, maybe the table topics master or one of the evaluators, <laughs> right? Right. I've been there, not fun. Achievement recognition. We monitor, we recognize members' progress and achievements. We might say, hey, you're only on speech three, let's get you moving a little bit. We provide huge amounts of support and congratulations and appreciation when you complete a CC or a CL, or significant progress towards each of those. We make it desirable to achieve. So what do we do with clubs that are not good, that are not de delivering high quality programs? Area directors, area directors raise your hand. Have you gone into a club meeting where any of those are lacking? This year? Yeah. Shout it out. Yeah. Yes. You filled out your visit form. It's kind of long and complicated. Hopefully you recognize that it's based on that, based on the moments of truth. I hope that you had a good long conversation with the club officers and helped them along the way. I remember being a club president. The area governor thought that the most important thing that we were lacking in our club was that we didn't have a hotel counter bell, ding, ding, ding to count the ahs and ums of our members. That was not valuable advice. That was not helpful to our club. Something about how we didn't recognize him at the door and even welcome him, that would have been much more valuable advice. So here's a truism about the moments of truth. When clubs are excelling in each of those categories, the club will be healthy and strong. 
when clubs are excelling in each of those categories, the club will be healthy and strong. If the club drops back, stumbles, fails, falls in any of those categories, club health and achievement begins to slow down. When we are in slow mode, panic mode, less than quality mode, we tend to focus on organizational things, administrative tasks, rather than on quality tasks. And it's hard to stand back up. And area directors, that's where you come in. Ask questions. Don't deliver decrees. Don't tell people how they have to do things. That's the biggest complaint that we get from clubs. And we get it every week. An area governor came in. How do we keep them from ever coming back? Because <laughs> all they did was tell us what we were doing wrong. They weren't part of the solution. Now, it happens occasionally that clubs do all of these things and are still not doing well. When that happens, there is a non-Toastmasters problem that is affecting that club. A non-Toastmasters problem may be that the club meets in the evening and you have to walk down a dark alley to go in the door. Those happen. It may be that the meeting venue they've chosen is so expensive that they've priced themselves out of the market. That happens too. It may be that there is a longtime Toastmaster in that club who demands that everything in that club run exactly according to how that person thinks. And that person drives people away. Please don't be, please don't become that person. Because Toastmasters is not about us individually. It's not about our beliefs. It's about each of the members of each of those clubs and their achievement through quality club programming. Area governors, I have some questions for you, area directors. Darn, I thought I was going to get that right. <laughs> so here's the question I asked you to think about a few minutes ago. What percentage of your time is spent directly promoting club quality. Area directors, call out that percentage at the count of three. One, two, three. 150 are the only two I heard. All right. The 100 percenter has delegated all the administrative tasks off to somebody else, probably. The 50 percenter, that's probably about right. I'd like it to be up around 75, 85% of the time, spending time promoting club quality. Because the inverse of that, then, is that you're spending time on other stuff. And, and that other stuff doesn't leverage your experience. And your experience as a member and a leader of a successful club is what is most going to benefit the clubs that you're serving. It's not putting on a great contest, though we love contests and they're important. But somebody else can do that. Somebody else can help you with that. Your job is to help that club achieve excellence. So the inverse then is the other side. You know, how much time are you spending doing stuff that, that probably needs to be done, but somebody else can do? It's not common in districts in this part of the world to have assistant area governors, area directors. It's going to take me a couple of years to get past that. But uh, pick out somebody to help you out. They might be the area director next year. Don't take it upon yourself. If you were in the club sponsor mentor coaches meeting last night, I talked briefly about informal teams. Informal teams are critical. We must have informal teams to help us get the job done. You can't do it all by yourself. That's just not going to work. This is when the district director and the program quality director look at me in shock. Area directors, is it more important that you be supporting your clubs or be here today? Supporting clubs. If you had the choice, and you probably don't have the choice, you can do both. But if you had the choice, I'd say, don't come to the conference. Go support those clubs. That's more important. That's what it's all about. So Smedley. And I love this photo of Smedley, and I, I try and use that several times during every presentation. We're used to the older Smedley from the 50s and 60s with white hair, and it's kind of far back like some of ours in the room. But this guy, this guy is young. This is the Smedley who started those first few clubs. Imagine that. 
This is the guy, a, a young, driven, adventuresome traveling man who bounced across the continent, finally ending up just down the road in Santa Ana, started not the first club there, but the first club that survived. He started clubs in Indiana and Illinois and in Central California before he made it to Santa Ana and started the final club there. In his opinion, districts, this is how he described it, this was the beginning of our use of the district plan, which has been so effective in growth and development. And in that section of his book, he talks about districts not being here for events, but to support clubs and to grow clubs. And that's what we do. And the rest of the stuff we do is either administrative in nature to support these things happening, or might be superfluous and not the most important thing. Now, I'm not saying that these aren't good time get-togethers, because they absolutely are. And the administration absolutely needs to happen. Someone over, someone back there said it right. The district is what binds things together. But the district's not the most important part of the organization. The most important entity is clearly the club. And the most important thing is the individual member and their experience. So this is a district conference. This one happens to be in Cotonou, Benin, West Africa, District 94. So what do you think their mission is? Oh, the same as yours? Yeah, it is. It's the exact same as yours. There are members from seven countries here. Now, District 33 is big. It's not seven countries in West Africa. It's a little easier for you to get from the Central Coast. My wife leaned over and said, clubs from Bakersfield and clubs from Las Vegas together? And I said, that's kind of a big stretched out geography. But these folks work very hard to get together from Nigeria, clear to the Ivory Coast, and up into Mali. That's a big, huge distance. Now, here's Japan. The first club was chartered in Japan in 1954. They've got a couple of islands. They've got about 200 clubs in one district. Their job? Support all clubs in achieving excellence and build new clubs. They're actually the legacy and the benefactors of the people who formed District 33. They're District 76. Because of what you did, your predecessors did, they exist. Here is District 82 in India. 20 years ago, India had seven or eight clubs. Now there are well over 600 and pushing five districts. District 82 set the record chartering 75 clubs in one year. That's a whole district. That's more than one a week. So it's a little more challenging for you here, admittedly. It takes some work, and we'll talk about club building a little bit more this afternoon. But club building, an integral part of what you do as a district. Hey, this is District 33. This was this morning, so you weren't all here yet. But this is you. These are the, the folks who represent you today and what you do. So why? Why is a district? We know what it is. A bunch of clubs grouped into areas of divisions. But why is a district? We support all clubs in achieving excellence, and we build new clubs. So I will challenge you to, as you approach any district activity, to ask yourself the question, does this thing that I'm doing support why the district even exists? And then if the answer is yes, please do it and make it better. And if the answer is no, don't do it. Don't do it. If you're doing things just because we've always done them, it's not a good enough reason. If you're doing things to support clubs and achieving excellence and to build new clubs, that's the right thing. So think about your conference today, and think about the things we're going to do, the things we did last night, and your district leader's focus. And think about future conferences. How can we focus these on these aspects, the reasons that districts exist? 
So will you join me in remembering why districts exist? Yeah. All right. Thank you.